All right, hi. Uh, nice to see everybody today. I'm just going to, there. I've not used one of these before, so you get to see me learning, learning on the job. Um, all right, so I'm Lara Apps. I'm currently a Director of Complaints Management at the Alberta Human Rights Commission. Um, I've only been in this particular role for a little bit. Uh, prior to that, um, I spent approximately seven years as a human rights officer, plus a, a few additional years, many years ago, as a contract investigator for the commission. Um, what I've kind of specialized in is investigations. Um, and uh, with a little bit of conciliation work on the side, I also uh, currently look after the conciliation team. That's the group of human rights officers that I manage. Um, so um, all of that just to give you a bit of a sense of kind of what I've been doing at the Commission for the last few years. Um, before we get started on the actual um, meat of this, um, I'd actually be interested in hearing, um, I understand that you're employers and, and entrepreneurs, what kinds of businesses are you engaged in? If anyone wants to give me an example, like the hospitality industry, producing goods, what, what are you doing? If someone's willing to give me an example. Don't make me pick someone. <laughs> And anyone else? I'm just I'm just looking for a sense of who I'm talking to. Yeah. I'm not for profit. I've heard of Blue Cross. Blue Cross. Okay. Anyone else? One more. Yeah. We're both actually coming from another nonprofit, the Brennan Center for Career Advancement. Okay. All right. Good. Okay. So again, I'm just looking for a sense of this. Who's in the room? What kind of entities am I am I speaking to here? Um, I don't think we have a, a massive amount of time, uh, which is kind of a shame because you could talk about the duty to accommodate for like a week. Um, so we're going to do kind of a fairly quick pass through some of the conceptual stuff. I will say that duty to accommodate is, well, maybe it's only because I've been doing it for a long time, but it's sort of simple sounding in the abstract. It's when you start trying to actually do it in real life um, that it gets complicated, as, as I'm sure you're, you're aware. Um, I understand there have already been questions about the duty to accommodate today. Um, so we'll have me doing a presentation, but I'm hoping to leave um, a decent chunk of time, about 15 minutes, for Q&A. Um, and we'll have a slide towards the end that has our contact information. So I'll just emphasize, you can always call us. Whether you're an employer, um, an employee, a customer, you know, it doesn't really matter. You can call us and ask us questions, and you'll talk to a human rights officer, and we'll, we'll give you some information. We talk to employers all the time. Um, and we think it's really beneficial for, for both sides. Um, you know, hopefully we can prevent a human rights complaint um, or you know, we can at least help you as the um, uh, employer um, or a service provider kind of navigate whatever situation you're in, okay? All right, and if I, if I forget and don't advance slides, perhaps Anne uh, will tell me it sounds like you need to advance the slide. Um, I've never totally gotten the hang of working PowerPoints. All right, so this is what we're going to talk about today. So what is accommodation? And then accommodation as an employer and as a service provider. If you're running um, you know, a business where you provide services to someone or you're a nonprofit, you make goods that you sell to people, um, then you're a service provider, kind of broadly understood, and the Human Rights Act also applies to you, and so does the duty to accommodate. So we're going to focus on the employment side, um, but I want you to be aware that that service provider Peace also entails the duty to accommodate. Uh, we'll talk a bit about the concept of undue hardship, bona fide occupational requirements, and the duty to inquire, uh, which is something that often gets missed um, uh, when we're talking about the duty to accommodate. Okay, so when we're talking about accommodation, we're talking about this right to full participation in the workplace and in the community. Um, you know, it's, it does mean you have to make certain changes. Um, and the whole purpose of accommodation is um, to fulfill your rights under the Act. But again, if you, if you think about it in terms of you're enabling someone to fully participate, particularly in the workplace. Uh, I was reading a book on um, 
the Abella report uh, from the early 80s about equity, employment equity, and um, that equality is not just about treating everyone the same, it's about accommodating differences so that people can participate. And so that's what accommodation is about. Okay. See, there's a lot, of, a lot of stuff here. And so when we're talking about the duty to accommodate, we mean your or your business's obligation to take steps to eliminate discrimination. So against employees, uh, potential employees, when we're looking at the hiring process and also customers kind of understood broadly, okay? Again, we're trying to balance these needs between the individuals and the group, and it can be a nuisance. It can be inconvenient, it can be disruptive, it can be expensive. Okay? What it is not is optional. Okay? This is an obligation under human rights law. Um, and so you do have to engage in that process and you do have that obligation. Okay? All right, so some key concepts. Uh, we'll, we'll talk a little bit about the areas and grounds of discrimination um, so that you're aware of what those are under the Human Rights Act, what we mean by reasonable accommodation, the idea that accommodation is a two-way street, both sides have obligations, what undue hardship means, what the bona fide occupational requirement, or B4, means. If you're reading decisions or um, you know, looking even at some of our information sheets, you might see that, that phrase, B4, and we're talking about the bona fide occupational requirement. Um, and then finally, that duty to inquire that I alluded to. All right. Okay, so these are the protected areas under the Alberta Human Rights Act. Um, you don't need to memorize these. Um, it's all in the act. But I've, I've bolded, hopefully you can see it okay, the two areas that we're talking about today. Employment practices is, um, I think, fairly... Uh, straightforward. It's anything you might be doing in the context of, of employment. Okay. But good services, accommodation, or facilities customarily available to the public, which is a bit of a mouthful, uh, that is our Section 4 under the Act, uh, I think needs a little bit of explanation. Um, goods and services, hopefully fairly self-explanatory. Goods are the things you might be selling, services you're, you're providing. Accommodation in this um, context does not mean duty to accommodate accommodation. It's more like if you were staying at a hotel, for instance, like physical accommodation. Um, and then facilities could be you know, a wide range of things. Um, if you were renting a hall for a function, for instance. Okay. So in all of these things, you have some sort of a service or good being provided to someone. And so if you are a business um, or a nonprofit providing services, then the duty to accommodate applies to you in that context, just as it does if you're in an employment context. Okay? So for instance, with Blue Cross, you have employees and you have clients, right? You have people who have Blue Cross insurance or they want Blue Cross insurance. And so the duty to accommodate applies in both of those contexts. Okay? All right. Um, again, We've got a number of other areas. There's membership in a trade union, um, applications and advertisements. But the main things we're focusing on is that goods and services and that employment practices element today. If we try to get into everything, we will not have, we will not have time to go through it all. Okay. And then the protected grounds. <clears throat> There's a lot of them. Um, I've bolded again the ones that I think are most likely to be of interest and to be relevant to you, the things that are most likely to come up based on the sorts of things that I've heard over the years uh, doing the inquiry line. So religious beliefs, um, again, you, I should say you have a duty to accommodate on all of the protected grounds, okay? but these bolded ones are the ones you're most likely to run into. Uh, religious beliefs, gender, this includes pregnancy and sexual harassment, so you have a duty to accommodate uh, an employee who's pregnant. Um, of course, we have gender identity and gender expression. Um, physical disability and mental disability are the categories where the commission receives the most complaints. So over the years, um, and, and you can correct me if I'm wrong about this, but I don't think I am, but, but depending on the year, between 70 and 80 percent of our complaints are employment related and they are disability related. Okay, um, So that is most of what we deal with, and most of it is accommodation. It's not, you know, an employee, generally speaking, um, it's not a case of 
oh, you have, um, you know, you have a, you're missing an arm, you have an amputated arm, you know, so we're not going to hire you or we're going to fire you because of that. It's, I've injured my shoulder or I need to go for cancer treatment. Um, you know, I have some other um, disability. We, you know, have encountered a few COVID cases um, where you have a condition, whether it's mental or physical, temporary or permanent, that is sort of basically disrupting your ability to work if we're talking about the employment context, okay? And this is where it does get complicated and where we get quite a lot of questions, okay? A, a request like I need a ramp because I use a wheelchair might be expensive if you don't have a ramp at your business, but it is at least fairly straightforward, right? The, the issue is going to be fairly clear. Whether you can do it or not might be more difficult. But um, accommodation um, requests might be far more complex than that in terms of what they need and how long it takes to figure out what it is this individual needs. Okay, so that's where all the complication comes in. Um, the other one I've flagged is family status um, because it might not be immediately obvious what that is. Um, family status is when um, an employee, and we'll stick to employees, has an obligation uh, typically to care for their children, uh, but it might be a parent, it might be another family member, um, and the most typical type of issue that comes up is around childcare. Okay? Not that it can't arise in other circumstances, um, but that's the usual one. And so, uh, again, you do have an obligation to accommodate someone who's got childcare obligations. Okay? All right. Okay, I'll pause for questions in a second. Uh, so what is the duty to accommodate? So we say this a lot in our um, decisions that the director issues. We say under human rights law, you have a duty to reasonably accommodate an employee or a service recipient uh, to the point of undue hardship. That's undue hardship for whoever is doing the accommodating. So you, in, undue hardship for the employer or the service provider. Um, accommodation does not have to be perfect. It doesn't have to be instant and it doesn't have to be what that individual would prefer, okay? So these are kind of those limitations on the right to accommodation. Um, but fundamentally, accommodation should be seen as a partnership, and this is what I mean as, as the two-way street, okay? So both parties have obligations, both parties have some rights, both fundamentally have a responsibility to ensure that you try to find the best option for accommodation, okay? And that may take some time. That's why we say it's not instant, right? It might not be possible to say, okay, oh, tomorrow we're going to do all of the things that you need for accommodation, okay? But you need to be making meaningful strides towards getting there. Okay. Uh, before we talk about the role of the employee, any, any quick questions? Is everything clear so far? Yeah, okay. All right. Did you already hear all about this this morning? Some of this, okay. All right, um, so the role of the employee. Uh, we'll start with them because it's typically going to be the employee or the customer, whoever it is, who brings their need for accommodation to you, okay? Um, they need to tell you what their needs are. They do not need to tell you what their disability is. They do not need to tell you what their diagnosis is, okay? That is a privacy issue. But they need to tell you what their needs are. Okay, so they, they need to tell you, okay, I have to pick my kid up at five o'clock. Uh, there's no one else who can do it. Um, this is a legal obligation as a parent. You have to collect your child from, from daycare. Um, I need to leave work by 4.30. I cannot stay past 4.30 in order to get there. Okay, that's the accommodation need. That's the request, okay. Um, the employee has to be willing to submit documentation that supports the accommodation request. Okay. Typically, that's going to be medical documentation. Okay. Um, you might um, say in the instance of childcare, perhaps you want to get some more information from them about the daycare hours. Um, but most of the time when we talk about supporting documentation, we're talking about medical. Okay. Again, the medical does not need to tell you what the diagnosis is. It shouldn't tell you that, okay? 
But what it does need to show you is what their, again, term of art, restrictions and limitations are. Okay? If they cannot lift over 50 pounds, and your work site requires that someone lift over 50 pounds, then the medical should indicate what their lifting limitation is. Okay? Can they do it once a day, but then they can't lift 50 pounds again? Or can they lift 10 pounds all the time, but never lift 50? Okay, so you need, to, you need to know those kinds of things depending on what kind of workplace you're in. Okay. And then the employee's role is also to suggest some options that might meet those needs. They probably already have an idea, like you know, maybe I start my day half an hour early so that I can leave half an hour early to go and get my kid from daycare. Okay? All right. Um, and we have more information about this on our website, and we brought uh, uh, quite long and involved information guide, uh, so you can pick those up after. The employee also has to participate and give feedback on the accommodation. So if it's not working, they need to tell you. Okay? Um, and they have to consider any reasonable options that you as the employer or service provider offer. Okay? All right. So your role as the employer, you have to be willing to accommodate. That's a pretty key starting point. If you're not willing to accommodate, then you're probably going to be talking to us at some point at the Human Rights Commission, um, which I'm sure you'd rather not do. Uh, you have to listen and try to understand their needs, explore or or explore all the options for accommodation and, Im and involve that employee in the decision making. Okay? So another way of thinking about this is kind of neither party gets to dictate what's going to happen in this process. Okay? It's a, again, two-way street. It needs, it's supposed to be cooperative. Um, and you're both trying to find a solution to whatever the issue is. Okay? With that goal of ensuring that your employee can fully participate in the workplace. And then you also, as the employer, can request medical documentation, documentation that identifies their limitations and the kind of accommodation requested that's related to work. Okay? Again, make sure it's limited to work. Right? You're not asking, can they mow their lawn on the weekends? Right? That's not what you're trying to find out. Okay? And then more things in roles. Um, these are uh, areas where you want to think about accommodation. And one thing I'd encourage you to think about as employers is, is sort of pre, pre-thinking this. Right? If you think about your hiring, hiring practices, how you assign work, um, and, and planning your meetings, social events, uh, and so on, you can kind of eliminate a need for someone to come and ask you for accommodation sometimes if you think about how have you organized this. Um, a very simple and, and kind of common example, um, you know, they did it for the lunch today. Do you have any dietary needs, you, you know, dietary restrictions that we need to consider? If you're planning a social event, um, think about where you're doing it. Um, think about your workforce. Uh, if you're always planning social events that involve going out for drinks at the bar after work, you might be excluding people who don't drink alcohol for religious reasons. Uh, you might be excluding people who don't drink alcohol because they have an addiction problem. Um, and so, you know, sort of pre-thinking some of these things um, might eliminate problems without forcing someone to come to you, right? And it gives you a more kind of welcoming and accommodating workplace, okay? Accessibility issues, same thing. Think about is your environment physically accessible to everyone, okay? Again, you think about it ahead of time um, and you can make life easier uh, for everyone. Um, and again, making employee assistance programs available to persons with drug and alcohol addictions. Um, that is part of the accommodation process, not necessarily having to pay for it um, to anticipate a question, um, but um, accommodating people with addictions. Addiction is considered to be a disability under human rights law, and so it is something that you have to, have to factor in. Okay. Um, these are some other elements for consideration, uh, making sure that everyone's got a clear statement of, of what their job is, the experience required. Uh, make sure you're considering people for positions on the basis of individual assessment. Um, you know, not thinking to yourself, oh well, you know, they have this particular disability for instance, um, therefore this isn't going to work. You have to 
you have to do an individualized assessment on what that individual's capabilities are. Um, in terms of performance management, make sure you're telling people what their duties and performance expectations are. Um, and tell them about any shortcomings. Um, the, the performance review, um, just switching hats here for a minute to the investigator side. Um, if you have an employee who's having performance issues and you are attempting to performance manage them and you're considering even terminating them, um, I would put in a plea to make sure that you are documenting the issues. Um, we get lots of complaints where someone's been fired. Uh, they say it's because I was pregnant um, or it was because I disclosed a disability or I needed long-term accommodation, uh, whatever the, I told them my sexual orientation, uh, whatever the issue might be. Um, and the employer argues, well, no, we made the decision to terminate them, you know, two weeks before she told us I was pre told us she was pregnant um, because of performance issues. Say, okay, where's your documentation for that? Where's your documentation of the performance issues and where is your documentation of when you made that decision that you're going to terminate this person? If you cannot produce that, we're most likely sending your case to the tribunal. And the complainant very, very well might be successful because of the timing. Okay, so if you are trying to manage someone's performance, make sure that you're writing things down. Make sure you're documenting it and you're telling them. You can't write on their performance reviews every year, so-and-so is excellent, and then try to tell us three months later, well, we fired them because of all these performance issues. We're frankly not going to believe you. Okay, so, you know, make sure that you're documenting these issues if you're, if you're having them. Okay. okay. All right, <clears throat> um, so we'll just jump in quickly here to medical information. Uh, when you are requesting a accommodation uh, as an employee, you might need to provide medical evidence supporting the accommodation request. That's again, it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, but if you say to an employer, um, you know, I need to work from home permanently in a job where people don't normally work from home, or again, I've got lifting restrictions or hours restrictions, whatever it might be, and it's a disability issue, um, then you're perfectly entitled to ask as an employer for medical documentation of that. Okay, I've touched on that a little bit. Um, you can't ask for the diagnosis. You can ask for a prognosis, which would be how long are these restrictions and limitations likely to be in effect? How long are they going to need the accommodation for? Um, it might be a week. It might be permanent. So, you, again, you want to know that when you're trying to come up with what the accommodation plan is. Okay. Um, we have uh, a guide to obtaining and responding to medical information in the workplace. I brought that along. Um, we also, on our website, have uh, a sample form that you can use, and it has sort of sample questions and a bit more information about what you can and can't ask about. Okay, so rather than getting into all of those details now, I'll refer you to that and to our, to our sheet. Um, just keep that in mind, though. The diagnosis is out of bounds. Um, and if an employee tells you their diagnosis, then you want to maintain confidentiality on that and respect their privacy. Um, it's unlikely that coworkers need to know what someone else's disability is. There might be circumstances where it is something that coworkers might need to know about, um, but you want to make sure you're talking about that with your employee. Okay, if someone, for instance, has epilepsy um, and might have a seizure at work, it's not a terrible idea, in, in my view, for someone to be aware of that. But you might need to limit that to management. Okay? Just make sure that someone is available um, to, um, to assist that employee. Um, but you want to respect their medical information while at the same time protecting their, their safety. But that's an example of a disability where there might be restrictions and limitations, um, depending on what kind of role they're in, um, against, say, working at heights. Um, so scaffolders, uh, for instance, um, different kinds of warehouses where perhaps they're going to work, work up high. Um, you know, that might be a, a restriction that they have, that they can't work at that high, high height. And so modified duties need to be developed for them so that they can still still work, um, but you keep those restrictions in mind, okay? All right. All right, so undue hardship. Uh, this is 
one of the most difficult things to deal with, frankly, in human rights. Um, again, it's a bit of a mouthful. Uh, what it says is that the employee has a right to be accommodated. The employer also has a right to conduct business in a safe and cost-effective manner. And so the accommodation um, goes up to that point of undue hardship. Okay? And what we mean by hardship is we're looking at financial costs, health and safety concerns. Those are legitimate. Um, we look at the size and resources of the employer. Right? A, a five-person operation has different resources than a massive oil sands company. Right? Um, and we would also look at the impact of what might be an increased workload on other employees. Uh, does the accommodation interfere with the rights of others? Okay? And how interchangeable are employees and the facilities and their duties? Um, so these are all ways in which we would think about undue hardship. Um, what I tell employers generally on the phones is that undue hardship is a very high bar. Um, you know, employers will sometimes say, oh, well, this is going to be really hard for us because everyone works the same schedule. Okay. That doesn't sound like undue hardship to me. Um, if, we, again, if we think about our child care example, um, you know, as the employer, you need to think about, is this actually an undue hardship to shift someone's schedule half an hour? Um, you know, or, or could you do that and make some minor changes to the way, the way things operate in order to accommodate that employee? Um, and child care obligations may not be a permanent accommodation, right? As kids age up, they age out of daycare, and they're in school. So you might only need to do it for a, a short period of time. Um, but we do hear this a lot, oh, this would be an undue hardship. And then we start asking questions, well, okay, is it really though? Um, and that's what you need to keep in mind. You have that duty to reasonably accommodate up to that point where you, you actually cannot anymore. Okay. It might be an undue hardship to put in an elevator for, for one employee. Right? An elevator is, I'm thinking, pretty expensive. Um, it probably would not be an undue hardship to put in accessible doors. Right? Um, so again, just because someone says, well, what I really want is an elevator, that, that would be your perfect accommodation but they don't necessarily get that. What you can say is what we can do is we can make sure there's ramps and we can make sure you work, that you have an office on the first floor. We will have our staff meetings on the main floor um, and you know, we will ensure that the doors are accessible doors. Um, so the Supreme Court of Canada has said the employer's hardship must be substantial in nature and that some hardship may be necessary. Um, the key piece here is, is you'd have to show that you would experience more than a minor inconvenience. Okay? Um, just because it's difficult doesn't mean it's undue hardship. Just because it's inconvenient or a little bit expensive doesn't necessarily mean it's undue hardship. Okay? And if you did have a complaint against you and you tried to say to us, well, it would be an undue hardship to accommodate this person, again, we would be asking you to give us some documentation to show us how, how, how is it undue hardship. It might be, right? It very well might be, okay? But your say-so on that is not going to count for very much with us. You need, it needs to be substantial, and you need to be able to substantiate it as well. Okay. All right, so again, uh, assessing this undue hardship. So here are some questions. Does everyone have to meet one single standard? You think about lift, lifting requirements, for instance, again, just to give something concrete. Um, does everyone have to do everything at the same pace, necessarily? Okay, or can you still operate while saying, okay, yes, we want everyone to finish 100 files in a month, but, okay, you, you're only working half time, well, obviously we're gonna cut that to 50, right? Or you have some other sort of restriction and limitation, it means you're not gonna go quite that fast, but you, you still are going to be a good producer for us. Is there another way to do the job uh, that would get around the problem? So modified duties, um, uh, we often see those sorts of examples. Have you thought about alternatives? Um, and we, these are the sorts of questions we would be asking you if we were investigating. Did you think of alternatives? And if there were alternatives, why didn't you choose those? Why didn't you do that? Okay. Alternatives might be another role for somebody. 
And again, in a big organization like, say, the government of Alberta, um, you know, we, we ask that question in a very serious way. If this employee is restricted from doing work in this particular unit, okay, what options did you consider for maybe moving them to a different unit and putting them in a different kind of role? Okay. And if you're a small or organization or a small business, that's going to be harder, but you still have to put your mind to what else could we do here? Okay. And then if you've got a union, um, have you consulted the union? Um, the, a collective agreement cannot discriminate against employees. So you can't have clauses in your collective agreement that say, for instance, the employer is not going to accommodate people with disabilities. Um, but uh, your if your accommodation would breach the collective agreement, then you need to also consider that um, and, and maybe coming up with some other option. Okay. All right, so the bona fide occupational requirement um, is something that we would look at when looking at have you reasonably accommodated someone and um, is there an undue hardship here? Um, this is something that's a necessary requirement. You'd have to show that changing the standard would create an undue hardship. Okay, so again, it might again be lifting, re lifting requirements. Okay? If everyone has to be able to lift a certain amount, um, carry a certain amount, um, have certain skills in order to be able to investigate files, for instance, make decisions on files, writing skills. Um, you think about airline pilots, they have to be able to see they need good vision, right? That's a bona fide occupational requirement, okay? We're not out of time, are we? Okay, good, okay. Panic for a second there. Um, so the airline pilot's a good example. That is a bona fide occupational re requirement. You have to have good vision. Right? You cannot be blind and have and be an airline pilot. Okay? Um, but lots of things that employers say are bona fide occupational requirements turn out not necessarily to be quite so bona fide occupational requirement when we actually start exploring. Um, and so again, you can't just say, oh, it's a bona fide occupational requirement. You have to be able to substantiate that. Um, so keep this in mind. And these are the tests. Is the requirement, sorry, is this rationally connected to the requirements of the job? Was it established in good faith, and is it reasonably necessary? Okay. This test came out of um, a case called the Marin case um, involving a female firefighter uh, in BC. Um, and uh, the case looked at the fitness test for firefighters and determined that it wasn't quite a bona fide occupational requirement, that the test could be changed um, in order to accommodate female firefighters. Okay. Um, they still have to have strength requirements, but did they need to be at that level that had been previously set? Um, so these are the things you would want to ask yourself when thinking about, do you have a bona fide occupational requirement? Okay, so the last major concept is the duty to inquire. Uh, again, I say this, this gets missed a fair bit. Um, we see this a, a fair bit in complaints. Um, so the duty to inquire arises when an employer knows or reasonably ought to know that there's a connection between an employee's work performance or their behavior um, and their disability. And what we sometimes see is, um, you know, a behavior's, uh, sorry, an employee's performance perhaps has changed, is diminished. And you notice this and you talk to them about their performance. Um, and or perhaps they're missing work um, because of a disability and you notice this, you talk to them about their absenteeism. What you need to do is ask them if there's a reason for this and if they tell you, yes, I've been diagnosed with cancer and I've been going to cancer treatments and the cancer treatments make me feel really ill and I'm having a hard time getting up in the morning and getting to work, then they've just told you there's a connection. Right? And you cannot then penalize that employee for the absenteeism that is linked to their disability. Right? Um, if they are not performing as well, sorry, I cannot read that. <laughs> five, five minutes. Five minutes to Q and A, or five minutes to. Oh, I'm so sorry. Okay, we've gone way over time. Um, 
I thought we were going to 2.30. Okay, um, so, so the duty to inquire then, um, it's important. You need to keep this in mind. We do get a lot of complaints. So the employer's done everything right except this bit, okay? Um, and then duty to report we won't worry about right now. Okay, we do have the confidential inquiry line and our website has a lot of information. Um, I'll, I realize I've not left enough time for questions. I thought we had more time than that. Uh, but if there are a couple of questions, um, then I can take those and I'll hang around for a bit before the next session. Um, and you can ask afterwards as well. Okay. okay, that's our website. We have lots of information on the website. I highly encourage going there. Okay. Uh, and Taya, if you wanted to um, distribute this, that would be fine. I don't have any notes on the bottoms of the slides. And so... Uh, sure. Okay. I also have some bookmarks that have like the website address Yep. Okay. Um, and then that's a, Q a QR code for, um, for our feedback form. Um, and so you should be able to uh, do that with your phone and, and link it to the, the feedback form. Um, any questions? We can get through a lot in three minutes. Yep. The employer has done their duty to inquire and the employee... Um, states that there's nothing wrong, or they don't want an accommodation, or they even offer an accommodation. Um, what are our, what are the employer rights in that case? Because then we would be going through performance management and like we're terminating that employee, but then they could go to human rights to say, could they not? We don't think we should. Well, we we don't deal with yeah, we don't deal with wrongful dismissal, <laughs> um, and so if they have told you that they do not require an accommodation and their issues are not related to a disability or some other protected ground, um, I think it would be difficult for them to make the case that they've been discriminated against based on a protected ground. Um, my question to you would be, are you aware that they have, say, a disability that is impacting their performance? Say we suspect that there is, mm. um, and the employee refuses to engage with us, and says nothing's wrong, leave me alone, uh, just let me do my job, but we know they're not doing their job well. Mm. They're not, you know, they don't have the performance that they're looking for. Right. You might be able to suggest that they go and get a fit for work assessment. Um, as, as one step, um, if you really think that's that's what the issue is, if you've got, but you need reason to believe that. Right, and so for, for everyone else, what, what you might be considering is, a, again, a change, right? If you see a change in behavior, a change in uh, work attendance, a change in their performance, a previously good employee is suddenly not doing well, um, that might be a sign that you need to ask some questions, which it sounds like you've done. Um, but yeah, you might think about a, a fit for work assessment um, so that you get some medical, um, and that might be a way of getting them some help. Yeah, before you take care. And if they refuse it, then I'm not sure there's much else you could do. So we could, once we know we've exhausted everything that we can possibly do, and we could terminate the employee, but then it could still end up. They, they can always situation. still make a human rights complaint, whether they'd be successful or not, um, would be the question. And, and I'm, I'm never going to tell you, yes, you can go ahead and fire somebody. <laughs> yes, now you're done. Now you can... Now you can terminate. I'm not going to tell you that. Um, but no, it sounds like you've done what you need to do, but that would be the, the kind of the next step that you might think about. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else? One quick one. Yeah. I have a question about a bona fide or PCR requirement. So what if it's, it's not a bona fide requirement, but it's one of the requirements that you need to get it for the creating space for who knows what to happen if they need to hire six people, right? Mm. Usually you would just hire four, and so in this case, I think maybe that might be half space, and then maybe they can refer to this and try to fix that. Would that still um, violate that bona fide requirement, the PCR requirement? If, and if, is that still like a, you have a duty of good faith in that situation, you know, this is the person I'll report this person to, and you're not going to say yes to this person that I'm going to report. Hmm. So they they so they're hired telling you yes I can meet this requirement and then later on they say no I can't is that okay um, 
It would depend, I think. If, they, if you said to them, well, you told us when we hired you that you could do it, and now you're saying you can't, again, you might be asking them for medical, right? And if the medical comes back and says, no, they can't, then yes, you do have a duty to accommodate that individual. Um, I think, though, that it's a bit more complicated because if they've, if they've knowingly misled you in the hiring stage, that's a bit problematic. Um, but, um, you know, but I think you, you might want to say, okay, yeah, does your medical support that you can't do this? Maybe the medical says, it, says they can do it. Right? You don't really know until you get that supporting documentation. Okay. All right. Are we out of out of time? Do we need to wrap up?